recognize any of these animal actor films? Hey, Mr. Wilson! Tell him I'm sick. I won't fit for you, George. Attention, everybody. This is Stuart. Hello, everyone. Are you all nuts? He's a mouse. Now that's the worst this guy's ever. That guy's definitely an alien. You don't like it, you can kiss my furry little butt. If you recognized any of those movies, you'll want to stick around for today's show because our guest is the trainer who is responsible for the animal actors that have starred center stage in a multitude of movies and films over the past 40 years. Hello, I'm James Jacobson, and welcome to The Long Leash. Today on the show, Mark Harden, a Hollywood animal trainer whose career spans decades. Decades is saying something in Hollywood. He has trained animals of all species and sizes, from elephants to ants and flies, and of course, dogs. It is pretty likely that you may have watched some of the animals that he has trained because he's trained animals for movies like Stuart Little and Hachiko and Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula and Arachnophobia, a few spiders there, and a little series called Pirates of the Caribbean. Though Mark has trained many kinds of animals, he says that when it comes to training dogs, they are particularly special. I'm sure we all agree with that. Dogs are able to learn complex behaviors and they are capable of portraying a range of emotions. Today on the show, Mark will take us behind the scenes in the world of animal acting. He'll answer questions like, how do you apply makeup to a dog to make it look old? And how do you keep a dog actor in perpetual puppyhood for an entire film? During our conversation, Mark shares with us the life of a wild animal trainer who transitioned into working in Hollywood and who has embraced the occupational hazard of adopting dogs that he works with. Mark Garden, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. So you're just a dog trainer. No, you're not. <laughs> not. <laughs> so in your field of, of how many years have you been in Hollywood training animals? So I just retired in January from 43 years. 43 years. Okay. 43 yeah. years, a few cats, a few dogs, but really you started off with a whole menagerie of wild animals, right? Yeah. I started with um, the big exotics. The biggest animal that you've ever trained and worked with in a movie is an elephant. Okay, that would be that would be pretty big. And <laughs> how many elephants have you worked with? I work specifically with maybe five. Okay, and then the smallest animal you've ever worked with? Well, I literally work with ants, but probably I've been a lot of spiders and a lot of flies. Okay, so from an insect to an elephant, you've worked with all the beasts, or almost all the beasts in Hollywood. Where do dogs rank in that hierarchy? The hierarchy of what's easy, what's hard, what's fun, what's miserable? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> dogs kind of have their own special place. So, um, you know, because everybody has one and everybody knows what they're capable of, a lot is written for them. So even though they're pretty easy to train, pretty easy to get the work back, the work is often difficult. They get the more challenging acting assignments. Yeah, so they'll write more difficult things. So like, I mean, a dog, you know, you can teach a dog a hundred, hundreds of tricks. A leopard, you teach six tricks, mm -hmm. right? Teach them to come, go to a mark, stay, walk on a leash. So there's very few things you have to teach them and you do everything with those four or five things that a leopard learns, where a dog, the sky is the limit. Now, I have read that you say that you may not be the world's best animal trainer, but you're actually a really good movie maker. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of better animal trainers than me. You know, and I watch some of this stuff and go, what the heck? How would you even begin to do that? <laughs> I mean, I know how I would make it look like that, but yeah. I don't know how you ever get it to really do that. You know, my Black Lab, he could let you know there are no tennis balls in that building at any given time. But other than that, you're on your own. <laughs> so what my job became or what I realized my job was a long time ago was I'm a part of a movie. 
And so I have to figure out why I'm in the band, what has been written, what's possible, what's not possible. And if it's not possible, then how can we continue to tell that part of the story? So, you know, most scripts, when you get them are impossible, you're like, okay, forget it. I can't do this. And then you start thinking and breaking it down to scenes and bits and pieces and going, well, I can teach this. I can train that. I can work this, manipulate the environment over here. And so you learn that it's not all about training. Training is only a piece of what you're getting on film, right? So like arachnophobia, obviously spiders can't be trained. So you learn that spiders can be learned and then you can train a crew how to film. Ah, okay. So sometimes it's not the animal that needs to be trained. It's just the perspective of, of the camera operator of where you well, place you know, the lights. How you set up a shot yeah. or how you manipulate the environment. On the dark half, you had a ton of birds and they were cutthroat finch and you couldn't really train them, but we learned them. And we learned that they were kind of like flying buffalo that they heard. And if you don't overheard them and give them an opportunity to make a better choice, then they will go wherever you really want them to. And if you want them to go over there, through all there, you know, light that up and darken this, and they're going to go to the lights. So we didn't teach them to go to their marks and sit and stay and flap their wings. We basically learned what motivated them and how we could move them through the stages and scenes to get the action they want. Now, did you learn this in film school? No. No, I learned this from screwing up. Yeah. Um, it's a very high pressure business. I, I, looking back on it, it seems like it's a lot of it is self-imposed. I mean, the industry imposes a lot. We're not doing anything that significant in the scheme of things. But when you're there, you're thinking, you know, you're curing cancer, you know, we're <laughs> treating childhood diseases. It seems so important and the pressure seems really great. There's a lot of money at stake, right? There's just a lot of money every minute in calculable mm -hmm. and that's sort of by design in the hollywood schema this is the most important thing when in fact it's just a movie right and when you go yeah it's not the most important thing but when you're in it like it's the most important thing right. and i think it we buy that premise we're there and we get paid and so yeah we accept the premise now you said a moment ago that sometimes you'll get a script and you'll be like I don't know how to do this. Is this because the screenwriter is just not thinking? He's just like, this would make the best film. This would advance the story the most. And they say, well, that's for people like Mark Carden to figure out. Yeah, at first I thought they're just a bunch of stupid people who don't know anything about animals. Right. But the more I went through the business, the more I get involved early, right? So some of these movies I'm involved really early, like in the developmental stage, right? Is this doable? Is it? So they get a script and then they start budgeting it and go, is it doable? If not, what can we do? We start realizing scripts are written in ways like, you know, I'll get a script and I'll be killing myself because they wrote this thing for St. Bernard. And I'm like, St. Bernard's not going to do this. Or we can't do it or whatever. And you're going, they go, well, we don't really mean a St. Bernard. We want the reader to get an image in their head, right? instantly so we've got literally one second for that reader to picture the dog so they say golden retriever so you're going okay well i got golden retrievers no we don't really want a golden retriever so one thing i realized is they're not writing for the finished product they're writing for the people who are going to buy the script mm. so if they're saying that it's a drever and we want the drever to do this and that people are going to read the script and they're going to say i don't know what a drever is throw it away wasted five minutes of my life so I've had writers come to me early in the writing process and I'm like, write whatever you think, right? Don't constrain yourself to the realities of what an animal can do, write what you think. And then we'll figure out how to make it work. Or at least you'll have communicated what you want it to do. Like nothing is in there for an accident, right? It's going to get cut if it is. So it's got to move the plot. It's got to develop a character. It's got to set a scene. I mean, the animals are there like every single thing, right? Like every prop, every piece of set dressing, every extra, every actor. They're all there because we got 90 minutes, two hours to tell this complete story. You got to buy into it in the first five minutes. So if I want to make this lady look super crazy, then I put 10 cats around her feet, right? Well, that'll do it for anyone who's listening to Dog Podcast Network. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. So, so you go, okay, so that's what you're trying to say, right? So it's not whether it's possible to put 10 cats around your feet. It's that you're trying to paint a picture with words and that's the quickest way you could, right? So if I have a quaffed poodle, that says something, or if I have a junkyard dog, that says something else. So sometimes it's setting a stage. Sometimes it's completing a picture. Francis Coppola told me on Dracula, he wants things crawling, walking, and flying because he wants the audience eye to see his gorgeous sets from the bottom to the top. Hmm. So if I have a a frog or toad jumping in the garden, your eye is going to go down there. And then I shoot a raven across the sky. and Then your eye goes up there. And so that's what he told me because I want, I want people to see my beautiful sets from top to bottom. And then you have characters, right? So then you have all the way up to incidental characters, like an extra all the way up to principal act. Okay. So you work from animals as the set dressing to animals as the character. When you work with someone like a great, director like Francis Ford Coppola, do they have the same level of appreciation for what is involved in the animal training part as a director on a, on a TV sitcom? Well, the great ones probably have more. They just seem to absorb more, but it's not always the case. Cause I've worked with some great directors who are like, okay, can I get a little sugar here? (laughs) I mean, I'm killing myself. So, I mean, it's all individual and personality. It's depends why you're there, right? A TV show, Episodic television is the hardest medium, right? I mean, it's, we're trying to create a movie in a week, mm-hmm. basically a one hour movie every week for 10 weeks, 15 weeks. It used to be 28 weeks in a season. And you're trying to make a movie every week. And it's just like, just get in, hit your mark and get out of our way. It's where it's a steamroller, right? And it's tough hours and it's, you got to be on top of it and you're prepping next week's episode while you're shooting pickup shots from last week's episode and filming this week's episode. I mean, it's like, you don't volunteer, you know, what do you want? How simple can you make it? Let's just go from point A to point B. Cool. If you can do that on an episodic television, they love, right? Don't cost us any time. Don't cost us any money. On a feature film, it's different and it depends what the animal is there for. So if it's a principal character, it's like, give me it all you got. Mm-hmm. Make this thing come alive. I want to know everything you know. I want to be able to get my movie through you. Because I basically become a puppeteer then, right? So they have to be able to communicate to me so I can communicate to the animals. So what do you mean that. a puppeteer? How, how so? Well, like a puppeteer is taking in this inanimate object and he's... You know, he's creating a character with it, right? right? So the director has to be able to tell the puppeteer what he wants them to do and how he wants them to do it and where he wants to look and that stuff. Well, it's the same with us, except I don't have any strings attached. So I'm working all the stuff that I put into my animal to get behavior that's going to help tell that part of the story. Okay. So if you're the puppeteer and the animals are the actors in this case... What is the role of casting? I mean, because there are a lot of elephants, ants, dogs that you could choose from. How picky are you in the casting process? I'm not picky at all. You pick and I'll get it on film, right? Do you not choose the animals? Well, I don't choose the individuals. Like if they're casting, it depends on what it is. And I will, my job is at the beginning of the film is to be a technical advisor Mm -hmm. before we go to film. Right. So I'm giving you options that are going to make everybody's life the best. Now, if it looks like it's going to be horrible and you don't the way you want to do it, and I can't convince you to do it. Otherwise I could just go, you got the wrong guy (laughs) because I don't want to spend six months on set trying to fit the square peg into this round hole. Right. But, the beginning of it's very open communication and you're trying to figure out what they want versus what they can get. So say like on a movie like Cats and Dogs, and they wanted to cast everything from scratch on the first Cats and Dogs. All those characters, none of them had been previously trained. We acquired all of them for the movie. We spent Cats and Dogs, I'd say probably a six-month casting process. Cast about five principal dogs, about four principal cats, and then we've built in the cast with other animals. Walk us through that six-month process. Why does it take so long and what's involved? Well, that was just 
directorially. So again, you want to look at some of the bones of building a movie. So you have a director who has a lot of great ideas and comes in like this. And then you have like 15 producers going, whack-a-mole, 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 bad idea, bad idea, bad idea. <laughs> and so it's that sort of getting this whole thing to the table and it's sort of just sort of narrowing things down. So in the first Cats and Dogs, there were all these characters, but he, the director had very specific things in mind. So it starts with books. Literally open up all my breed books and go, these are the breeds. I really like to go to foreign country breeds because we can get interesting looking breeds that people here don't know what they are. And so they look like they don't look purebred. Mm -hmm. So in the movie, Catsland, so it starts with a foxhound and her puppies. Their tricolored puppy ends up becoming the principal character in the movie. I'm not going to work puppies for six months because they're not puppies for six months. So you're talking about how many litters of tricolor dogs and you get two weeks to train and they're good for about two weeks and two weeks to train another set and they're good for about two weeks. So that would have been a deal breaker for me. I would have not done it if they went with puppies for that character because the character's literally in every frame of the movie. And so we were with pocket beagles. So a pocket beagle is a miniature beagle, right? 11 to 12 inches high instead of the 13 to 16. And put a couple of pocket beagles in with a foxhound. And all of a sudden you have puppies. It's the relationship. It's, again, movie magic. Yeah. Right. So all I need is a brief visual of foxhounds with pocket beagles. And you've got puppies. And you can do the same with poodles. Give me two standard poodles and a teacup. Teacup is now a pup, right? So I don't have to train pups. So we got young beagles who still had a lot of energy, but they had a full brain. They're not going to change in the course of the movie. I don't have to match tricolor jogs for six months, which is impossible. Because they would have to then, I guess, makeup, they'd have to paint the dogs. We'd have to do makeup, and you can yeah. definitely go darker, but you can't go lighter, right? You can't. <laughs> remove a black spot very easily and this was kind of but cgi was just starting so anyway that's a casting choice right go let's just go with pocket beagles and then we went with a big heroic dog and i was really pushing for a smooth coated collie because people don't know what they are people don't see they see collies and they see the big beautiful lassie dogs mm -hmm. smooth color coated collies to me look like superhero they look like kind of a down disney character Mm. Right. They're like, I'll save you now. And I thought they would have been really a good choice for that character. But the director wanted something bigger and more menacing. And so we went with Anatolian Shepherds, which I'd never heard of. Like, I don't know what an Anatolian. He saw it in a book. Right. So I'm like, now I got to go research Anatolian Shepherds. Now I got to go find people who actually breed Anatolian Shepherds outside of Turkey. And then so we started going to dog shows. So then I take the director to dog shows. And we start looking at types. You're not casting an individual. We're looking at types. Once we narrow down the types. Wait, then so you actually, you go to, you bring the director to a dog show locally or you do you have to. I've taken him to dog shows, cat shows, rat shows, mouse shows, <laughs> spider shows, bird shows. Are these all and in LA have, or do you like just yeah, get on a plane? I mean, and yeah, we're all in LA. Okay. Everything's yeah. in LA. Okay. And so then we just started, he started looking at things. He sees a Chinese crescent going, oh my God, what is that? It's a Chinese crescent. Can we get those? I'm sure we can. You like them? We'll get them. Right. And so then. That's how we get through the casting. Salukis, we had Salukis, Anatolian Shepherds, Chinese Crestids, and Pocket Beagles were our main, and a sheepdog, right? So with the exception of the sheepdog, it's all very strange breeds. So it starts with finding the breed that you're wanting to work with, and you almost always work with purebreds? Well, for a feature film, we always sort of steer them in that direction. Because unless you were lucky to find a couple of brothers in a shelter of mixed dogs, which you do, and we're always on the lookout for, it's really hard. You're not going to do a movie with one animal, mm -hmm. and you're not going to get the movie insured with only one animal, mm -hmm. right? They're not going to say, we're not going to put this, you know, $40 million movie out there, and we're it's relying on this one, you know, <laughs> seven-year-old Yorkie <laughs> to live <laughs> healthy or whatever. So we have to have multiples plus. I mean, the dogs are 
capable of a lot of range of emotion. Unlike cats, they have very little range of emotion, but the dogs have a big range of emotion. You can get a lot out of a single dog. But generally, your main character is going to have the biggest arc, right? That's what makes him your main character because he travels the furthest in his journey. And so in the period of time we have, it's easier to get three dogs that might have three different dispositions so that I want the little quiet dog that, you know, sleeps by the fire and with the little girl that has to go and kill a bear next week. I'm not going to take that dog who sits with the little girl and work him up so that he can look like he's killing a big bear. Mm -hmm. So depending on the action, we go, this is my heavy duty action guy. This is my quiet guy. This is my sort of main character. And then if my main character has some heavy duty action to do that day, I may not want him just sitting by the fire. On, I may want to keep his energy up, not work him down. So I'll put in his double, just lay by the fire. Or there could be some very high energy activity scenes that my principal is capable of doing, but because I don't want to burn him out, you know, for the rest of the day or for maybe some of the really heavy duty close-up work or something, then I'll let the action jacks go do that bit. What's the magic number? You have a double, a triple? How many redundancies do you want in a dog? Well, I mean, with a dog, I've had as few as one double, like, mm -hmm. you know, two dogs, two as many as five. Okay. And it really depends, too, if we're doing a lifespan. Mm. So obviously, we're doing a lifespan. We need five puppies. With Tachiko, you know, there was like four puppies, and they were Shiba Inus. They weren't Akita Inu. They were Shiba Inus because you could get... 15 week old Shiba Inus instead of trying to work with eight week old Shiba Inus. We could get 15 week olds or eight week old Akitas. We can get 15 week old Shibas to play puppy Akitas. And then, so we had parts four Shiba Inus to play the puppy. And then we had three dogs to play the adult. Two dogs played most of the life, and the third dog just played the old dying dog. And when they. Or the uh, okay, spoiler. And then when you have uh, these doubles or triples, visually, do you see the difference? Do you know the difference between them? I tell you, by the time the movie's made, sometimes no, to be honest with you. I have to go back and remember who did it. Like, who did that? I mean, sometimes it's painfully obvious. and you, I hate that. But if it's used properly, you know, a lot of times I only know the difference because of the action because I know my principal can't do that. But it's like a stunt double, right? If I'm taken out of the movie because that stunt double is so horrible, then we've screwed up big time, if you're noticing that. But I always tell people, I doubled Christopher Reeve in his prime. Like, and the guy's like 600. You, you did? Yeah. I didn't know that part about your career. You I'm 5'8". <laughs> I you know, weigh 155 pounds stopping when Christopher Reeve was probably in his prime, you know, six, six five, yeah, yeah. right? He had a foot on me, but it was wolf attacks and nobody else could do them, right? And they just shot it in a way and you could not possibly tell the difference. Again, movie magic. But when you look at the films or even when you're on set working with the principal or a double, how do you identify them by the dog's name or? Yeah. Okay. So you start to like relate to them as, as the dog's name. Well, I mean, I train them, right? So I train them for four months or five months before we go to camera with them, you know, so I get them, I train them and then I work them on set. So they are, they are, I don't go and pretend like, Oh, let me, let's just go put this guy away and bring this guy out. And I've given them all the same names. So hopefully nobody notices when I use a double, everybody knows I'm using a double. Yeah. Ideally the script supervisor is making a note of it. Cause if we have to go back and redo something or something, we know. So a lot of times it's just a tiny bit of makeup. So I had the three Egyptian mouths on Catwoman, and they were Halle Berry's, you know, totem, I guess. And my lead cat was striking. Like his gray and his white and his silver and his black were all so sharp. And his doppelganger was not striking. <laughs> It was like the difference between me and Christopher Reeves, right? The guy <laughs> was really looking at my app. So I just took a little color pen, like a one that a child could suck on. And I would just before I take, just darken some of the stripes on the cat's face or whatever part was going to be prominent. 
I would just take a little mark, a little non-toxic water soluble marker and just touch up those areas to make that cat a little more striking. Whether anybody would have noticed, I don't know, but it made me feel better out doing my job. So are you often the one applying makeup uh, markers to animals or is that, is that the makeup department? No, we pretty much do it ourselves. Yeah. Just sometimes it's with the help of a makeup person guiding us, but the contact is just easier. Yeah. We do the contact, right? So they'd be eating the brush. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so in, like on Hachiko, so Hachiko, we had the, it's a lifespan of a dog from puppy to spoiler alert death and um they originally wanted a dog and i'm like a a healthy old akita doesn't look that different than a young akita <laughs> i mean you know their coats are gorgeous unless they have some skin problem or hair problem they're gorgeous so and my akita that i used for the movie he died at 13 and he was as gorgeous when he died as you know you couldn't tell other than that so and if it's because they're uncomfortable moving, well, I'm not going to use them on a movie set, right? So if they're unhealthy, I'm not going to use them on a movie set. So I didn't want to do it with an old dog, like a really old enough to sell the part, right? So I wanted to train a dog to act old, and then we did makeup, right? So I developed the makeup during the pre-training process. I started messing around with how do I make this dog look old? And I would do things like, you know, wet the concrete and have him lie down, have get up and I would see where the water, where he was putting the most contact. And so those are the areas I would work with makeup, right? I would work them in over weeks of time as opposed to, we can put, we're two dimensional. You can put makeup on me, I look the same. But a dog is three dimensional because there's depth to it. So instead of just applying it on the surface, I wanted to go deep into the hair, right? I wanted to do mats. I wanted to do fly bites and I wanted to do tear stains, all the things that old uncared for dogs do. And that took time and I didn't want to screw up. So like even the tear stains, I would just take a little bit of Vaseline and every day add a little, add a little until I had the trail that I like. Then I would add color to that. So I wasn't staining his skin. So I applied his makeup and then I weighted his tail. I just put a tuna weight in his tail before every take with him. So it wasn't his big old Akita tail. It was sort of a droopy, broken okay. tail. And I trained him all. I trained him to move, right? And trained on a very low energy. So every night when you wrapped done shooting, would you remove the makeup or would he, he would no. keep the Vaseline and everything? Okay. Yeah, I would have the makeup. In fact, I applied it for the actual filming over a course of three weeks. So I started three weeks from his first day and started gradually applying it. That's how I did it when I did it originally. It's easier to add more. It's really hard to take it away uh, without washing it off, right? So I just wanted it to be part of this coat. Let's talk about the role of CGI. For those who are listening to this and dog lovers and don't know what CGI, what is it? And most importantly, how has it impacted what you do in movies in general? So... CGI is computer-generated image, right? So all the images that are created by the computer. So it can be as little as raising an eyebrow, right? It could be my dog, and you just go, huh? Right? So the computer guy takes my dog's eyebrow and goes, huh? Or it could be as complicated as building a 3D model on the computer of that animal and being able to get him to do anything you want. I remember the first time when Narnia came out to the movie theater, I joke with my wife about this. I sat there and I was like, this changes everything. Because, you know, <laughs> he, was, he was all CGI. Yeah. So it's gone through a weird phase. So in the beginning, everybody was afraid it was going to take our jobs. And then we realized, wait, it just made my job that much longer because now... <laughs> It takes them longer to create and train the CG animal than it takes uh, me to get and train a real one. Uh, so like on cats and dogs or a Stuart Little or something, I might have to come on board three or four months early to get the animal and start the training process so I at least can have enough control so that the CG company can model, right? Because there's a lot of work. We do a lot of photography and they have to put up with a lot. 
I mean, some CG houses, and they're all different. Some CG houses, you just have to put them up on a box and they project a grid on them, you know, and you do it front side, every side from the top, from the bottom, and they just project this grid on them. Others, they're in a box with a thousand cameras that literally all go off at the same time. (laughs) And, you know, it's like conditioning a dog to that is really difficult. So it depends on the company and some are tedious and they not only do it on the day and they physically and they measure their fat and the skin and the you know little things that they measure everything with. So we needed to get them really early to prepare them so that they can then computer company can get the information so they can start modeling and working CGN. So that was that was like, oh, hey, I just made twice as much money on this movie than if it was not CGI. <laughs> but then they also, a nice side effect of it was we could start doing things a lot safer for the cast, crew. So when I was a young whippersnapper, I mean, I had Leopard sitting three feet from Sarah Fawcett in her prime without cable. Right. Same with Elizabeth Taylor in a pool with a leopard behind her. You know, so we did all that. I had leopards running through Rancho Park in Beverly Hills at night to do a scene in Panama. They didn't have cable replacement. I had to take what, them off. Cable re- explain cable replacement. So cable replacement, they can replace anything, right? Just like on the new camera, right? I can get rid of something in the background. I just grab it and get rid of it. Place it with what it was. So when you have something to replace. Basically with Photoshop in motion yeah. pictures. Yeah, right. Okay. So they go and they you know, do the scene with the animal. They lock the camera. They run another couple seconds of film. So they have a plate. So anything they remove, they can put back what was behind it, right? And so if you're running a cable, you have to have a cable on your animal to keep them safe or to keep everybody safe. Mm -hmm. Then you run the animal through there. The computer grabs the cable, finds the cable and grabs it through every frame. And then they just replace it with the plates. So no cable. I'm going to let my dog out. Your dog has been very patiently saying, I want to go outside. (laughs) I know. (laughs) It's the light comes through there badly. And so I have to close this doggy door when I do these. But anyway. (laughs) No, I understand. I was like, why is he looking out? What's outside? (laughs) Tell me about your dog. This is DPN. So tell me about your dog. That's Murphy. I got him as a 14-week-old puppy on the movie Dog Days. So he was just a puppy on Dog Days. He had one or two little scenes at the end of the movie. He was a gift. He came from a rescue out in one of the counties around here as a puppy. And we borrow them. So we'll do like a multiple of their adoption fee to borrow them for a week, you know, train them enough to get the scene. And then we return them. So then they can adopt them out to a home. We don't raise puppies in our business. We right. get young dogs, broken dogs and fix them. But I fell in love with him. My Akita was getting old. And so I kept him after. The- so I adopted him after his filming time and brought him home. It's a little boxer beagle mix. How many dogs have you brought home from set and said, this is my dog? Three. Okay. Is that an occupational hazard? It is. And I had to learn that very young. Fortunately, I started with wild animals and I couldn't. So <laughs> I, I can't bring home the elephant. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I brought home a lot of animals to expose them to my children and to expose them to uh, <laughs> interiors because they yeah. lived up in wild animal compounds. So a lot of my desensitization process entailed bringing animals home, taking them to my kids' schools and doing all that stuff with the wild animals. But I did learn that I can't possibly take all the ones. I did Dukes of Hazard, the original one. They filmed near where our compound was, and they were looking for bass that we didn't have any. So I went to all the bass rescues. I went to all the animal shelters. I'm looking for bass. I'm looking for bass. Well, we didn't get a bass. The job went to somebody else. And about a year later, one of the shelters, oh, we have a bass. And so I I went to look at it because I felt bad. Like I asked for bass, and now I'm like, never mind. And a bass and his sister had been dumped out of a car or something, right? And so I'm like, now I can't not take him. So I took him. And I gave that sister, I found a home for the sister, and I kept the male because the females don't really work because they're not as bassity. When someone wants a basset, they want a basset. So I kept the basset. He never worked a day in his life. I trained the crap out of him, but he just never worked. And I think it was because his 
visible masculinity was too large for film. <laughs> it was too obviously a male basset. And I could never... A very well-endowed dog. Yes. And so I ended up with this basset for his whole life, and he was never really that great of a pet. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you felt sorry for him. I felt obligated. Like, I had obliged myself, you know, and they go, oh, we found a basset. And they were so excited. And I'm like, yeah. So anyway, but I took home... Actually, she never appeared in the Dennis the Menace movie, but I had worked with a breeder and I leased some Briards from a breeder and I leased two of her Briards. Never heard of a Briard before Dennis the Menace. And I leased these two Briards, fell in love with the breed, by the way. I mean, they were just awesome. She had had a turn, like she was a breeder. So, you know, if someone dog didn't work out, it came back. So she had a dog that came back because they never socialized the dog. And then by the time they did, it was too late. They're livestock guardian dogs and they're very suspicious to begin with. So they returned the dog and I kept it. And we filmed that in Chicago. So I had two leases that were doing the movie and this 18 month old little skittish female in my apartment in downtown Chicago. And what a great way to get someone not to be skittish anymore. <laughs> she had to go everywhere we went, right? So I took her all around Chicago. We wrote buggies. We did everything. And um, she ended up being a really great dog, well-trained dog. And I kept her as a pet. Well, I want to know how the conversation goes with your, your wife, your family, when you say, <laughs> I'm going to bring home this animal because I want to acclimate them to indoors. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. And to children, which is the yeah. harder sell, right? Well, I want to make and sure take them to the ever... school, you said. So how does that go? And what's the craziest thing you brought home and, and did it ever get nixed? Well, I mean, <laughs> the craziest thing is I, I, I became obsessed with kangaroos when I was young. And partly because I took a kangaroo to a commercial for kangaroo tennis shoes and the actor was horrified. Of it. And I was in my 20s bit. And they said, why don't you run with the kangaroo? It was just a print ad. I didn't have to act or anything. I just have to go running with the kangaroo. Yeah. And I'm like, I run with the kangaroo all the time. No problem. So they, <laughs> they sent me kangaroo tennis shoes for years. But anyway, um, so I ended up doing this print ad for kangaroo tennis shoes and did multiple ones. And I just got really interested in the kangaroos. And then I decided I wanted to breed maybe Waller. Right, they're not as big as a kangaroo. They're smaller. They're in between a wallaby and a kangaroo. So they're, you know, like compared to a kangaroo, they're small. But compared to a wallaby, they're big. Yeah. And um, I went to visit a kangaroo breeder, and there was a baby kangaroo on the ground. And I'm like, oh, what happened? And he said, oh, you know, if anything goes wrong, they just dump a baby because they've got another one waiting. So they'll fertilize two. They crawl out of the mommy and go into there, and one of them will not develop. And the other will develop. And so one kangaroo develops in the pouch, and the other one just sitting there, like a, you know, in the wings, waiting for the lead actor to break his leg. And if something startles the mother or anything happens bad, bad weather, she'll dump the babe. An heir and a spare, literally. Yeah. And then they, then the next one will start developing. Wow. And so this was a dump babe. And so I go, will it live? He goes, yeah, I mean, I don't, I used to, but I don't, it's just too much work. And I let the moms raise it. And I said, can I raise it? And he's going, yeah. So he gave me bottles and formula. My wife made a vest with a pouch in it. No. And I carried this wallaby in a pouch with me everywhere I went. I had this food in my pocket, so it was warm. I fed him 20 times a day. I even read that when they... When is it time to come out of the pouch? And the mom like starts nibbling and the baby will start nibbling, stick his head out and start nibbling grass. So I literally went out to the backyard and it would read the newspaper on my hands and knees. So this wallaby would start poking around and trying to eat grass. <laughs> and I raised him and he lived in my backyard for five or six years. My children, my dog with my tortoise, and we all lived happily ever after. That is a Hollywood story if I have ever heard one. So you were a kangaroo mom by, by proxy. Yeah. That is extraordinary. <laughs> uh, then I have to take it back to the compound because he was growing up with my kids, but he was becoming sexually mature and they weren't wallabies. Uh -huh. So he started to bully them. They got scared and they're not the kind of animal that you can knock that off, right? They're just giant, stupid rats. How big was he when you had to send him back at five? He was probably two and a half, 
feet tall if he sat up. Okay. Probably 35 pounds. Did you pounds. feel like you were giving up your child that you had uh, effectively <laughs> pouched for a while? I felt like like maybe like a you know the 18-year-old or 35-year-old in the basement playing <laughs> video games. He he had soiled the nest adequately to go go on, have a good life. <laughs> right to us, come and visit. We're always here for you. And so he lived at the ranch for the rest of his life. <laughs> Well, this is a really good place to take a quick break right here. But when we come back, we will hear more about Mark and how important insurance is when dealing with the animals on set. We'll be right back. And now, a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach. And I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to roll in the grass and warm my belly in the sun. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Everpuff. The green, grassy, beef liver spike smell wakes my senses. You may not realize this, but it tastes like homemade gravy, especially when you wet it. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it, Everpuff traveling to every cell in my body, nourishing each one. It helps me feel like I'm on top of the world. I'm so glad you're giving it to me every day because every day I'm so glad to be with you. I wouldn't have it any other way. I want my Everpup. It just makes me feel good. I am so grateful to be your dog and for the Everpup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup every day. We are back with Mark Harden. We talked a little bit about the bones of Hollywood. You mentioned briefly the role of insurance, and I think that's important for people who don't really understand the industry, because that financial component is something that undergirds a lot of the decisions that are made in any movie, but especially a movie where you're dealing with animals as, as important characters. Well, or anything, really. You know, the actors are insured. I was insured on a couple of movies as a trainer because I'm working a wild animal that nobody else could work and the animal's principal character, right? So mm-hmm. they had to get insurance against me getting sick mm-hmm. and not dying and not finishing the movie, but maybe I missed three days and they can't shoot for three days. So they don't only have insurance for like catastrophe. They have insurance for every day. They have insurance for rain, right? That we lost three days because of rain. And so, you know, if it delays filming, then they can collect up their insurance. But obviously the people who write the insurance are idiots. And so they're making sure that, you know, you're not shooting, you know, the rainy season outdoors. Like you have a contingency for that, which we do. And it's called cover set. So on in the winter in LA for those seven days a year, it might rain. And you're <laughs> more lucky enough to have scheduled your outdoor shot on those seven days that we have cover set. So when you are building a schedule, you look at your cover schedule as well, right? It's really hard with animals because they may have to be prepared for something that's not supposed to shoot for two months and it rains and now all of a sudden we have to shoot it. But they have contingencies for, you know, accidents, and stunt problems, and everything that's going to possibly make the movie more expensive than anybody bet on. And so animals, yes, they don't ensure our quality. You know, like if I just am really lousy at my job or having a bad day, that's not covered. But if something should happen to the animal and the animal is insured for completion, then yeah, insurance comes in. So they've got to make sure that we train them properly. We have enough backups to do the movie. They're trained properly. And they're healthy when we start. Okay. Earlier you said, I asked you, did you learn this in film school? I was half joking. I know you didn't go to film school. You learned this just by doing Is there a route for people who want to go into this type of animal training? Not really. There used to be, there was a school in Southern California, a little town of Moore Park. It was a junior college. It is a junior college. And they had a program called Exotic Animal Training and Management. And it was the only real animal training school. 
they didn't specifically train for movie work. They trained mainly training and handling of exotic animals. So they were training people to go into marine parks and circuses and even working in research facilities where you had to train things to do things. So whatever, whenever an animal was to be trained. And a lot of the movie companies were involved in that because they culled from there to get young trainers, right? So we would do seminars and we would do, you know, sort of bridge the gap between training in a training facility and working on set, you know, and sort of talk to the kids about that stuff. I was actually poached from that school during my first year there. I was there because I wanted to be a dolphin trainer. Touched one. I'm a failure. That was my <laughs> only dream since seventh grade. Yeah. <laughs> Failed. I've even taken fish to those places, you know, the hotels that have dolphins and tried to lure one over. I've never touched a dolphin. Like you I refused never? to I refuse to pay to pay for it. So um no. But I did sea lions and that's how I started. I was sort of poached in that program to work with them sea lions at circus act. Horrible as it seems, it was a long time ago when there were still animals in circus acts. We did the best we could. I shared your ambition to work with, to, to swim with dolphins for the longest time in my life. And obviously I live in Hawaii and I would spend a lot of time trying to be in a position to swim with dolphins and it never worked. And then finally one day I was out on a boat and I was sort of meditating and I had just given up. I said, if it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. It's fine. I'm okay. It's my birthday. I was really expecting it. And then and I was had my eyes closed and the captain said, look. And he says, if you fall overboard, I guess it's okay. So <laughs> I uh, fell overboard and, and then I had the most incredible encounter because you're not supposed to obviously marine mammal protection. Right. You can't go, but it was the most incredible encounter. And that totally gave me an appreciation even deeper than I had always, I knew I wanted to do it. So someday, Mark, hopefully you'll come to Hawaii and have a similar experience. And they just come to you and then it's like, whoa. It was at Hilton in um, Waikiki. Yeah. They had the first dolphins I've ever seen like that, right? And they were just living in this hotel pool. <laughs> I was working in Hawaii and I would go there all the time and go, they know I love animals. Look at me. I'm an animal lover. I would just sit there and look appealing, yeah. right? And hopefully they would come over and want to visit me or maybe get a job or something. I don't know. But none ever did. I might have been escorted <laughs> off the property a couple of times. <laughs> I might have been. Yeah. Yeah. Sea Life Park in Hawaii a long time ago, they had actually, when I was doing circus work with Sea Lion, did offer me a job. So I can't say I'm a failure. I did make a decision at one point that I don't think I want to work in that corporate mm. structure of animal training. Got it. Because you have a head trainer and he decides, you know, you have script writers and a head trainer. And then, you know, you become a clicker, a fish thrower. It takes a long time. Those guys never die. They never quit. It takes a long time to matriculate up to having any sort of creative decision making in the training of a dolphin it's all very mechanical and scientific at those parks so i'm like going i'm out here i'm 20 years old i've got sea lions i can play with anytime i want teach them anything i want i go swimming with them in the ocean i can do anything i want with them and all the other animals i got to work with so i did make a conscious choice not to go work for a, a marine park and um, stuck with the, the beasts that's probably a good choice when you when you look back at your 40 plus years as an animal trainer if you were to give advice to yourself back then when you were 18 what would that advice be hmm. i would just say enjoy it more like it's gonna go by fast and just i was working a lot i was working hard i enjoyed it but I found I enjoyed things more in retrospect than in the moment. And movie making is very stressful and it's very easy to get caught up in there. And I would say, don't forget, you're doing things that so many people would die to do, you know, but, and it's the intimacy with the animals was remarkable. I raised them as babies. They were in my rooms, in my bed. It wasn't like a zoo or any, they were in my car. Everywhere I went, I took animals. So, yeah, I would recognize how enjoyable those parts of the world were they were happening. Mark Harden, thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate learning the whole menagerie of animals that you've worked with. It's been great having you.
Nice meeting you. What an incredible life that Mark has lived. I love spending so much time with all those various animal actors, small and big, but especially the dogs. If you enjoyed our conversation today, you might want to check out a similar episode on our sister show, Dog Edition. It's called Lights, Camera, Bark. Hollywood dogs, and you guessed it, it's all about what goes on behind the scenes with dog actors and their trainers and how they prepare for extremely difficult scenes. You can find that episode at dogedition.com or you can find the link in today's show notes. Well, that is all we have time for today. I want to thank you for joining us. I would like to encourage you to favor us, follow us in your favorite podcast app, which is also available on YouTube. And please, if you enjoyed the show, tell a friend about Dog Podcast Network and The Long Leash. I'm James Jacobson. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Aloha.